What's next? This is a question we're all having to ask and answer more frequently. I'm Jenny Blake, your host of the Pivot Podcast and author of Pivot, The Only Move That Matters is Your Next One. For show notes from this episode, visit pivotmethod.com slash podcast. If change is the only constant, then let's get better at it. Here we go. Hello, friends. I don't normally record a separate intro that just creates too much extra work for the podcast. But in this case, I had so much fun interviewing Mitch Joel that I didn't even get to introduce him properly at the beginning and read his bio. Some of you may not need to that at all. It's such a fun, wandering conversation about ideas, the skill every person must have, why we believe in friend tours, how he produces so much content each week, even his side project podcast about one of his biggest passions. But for some of you, I find having a bio is helpful just to sort of contextualize this person that I'm going to be listening to for the next hour. I also want to read you where I quote Mitch in the afterword to the paperback edition of Pivot because it's wisdom that has really stuck with me ever since he so generously had me on his podcast, Six Pixels of Separation, when the book launched. A little bit more about Mitch. Mitch is the founder of Six Pixels Group, an advisory investing and content producing company that is focused on brands, commerce, community, and what's next. He has been called a visionary, digital expert, and community leader. He's an entrepreneur, investor, author, trusted advisor, chronic reader, and passionate speaker who connects with people worldwide by sharing his insights on business transformation, innovation, and marketing. He was awarded the highly prestigious Top 40 Under 40 and spent close to two decades building, running, and selling his agency to WPP, one of the most valuable marketing and communication holding companies. He is the author of two books, Six Pixels of Separation and Control-Alt-Delete, Reboot Your Business, Reboot Your Life, Your Future Depends on It. That's the latest. That was out May 2015. And his new direction is about decoding the future. He's so prolific. He's so well known as a colleague to so many of us in the writing and speaking communities. And he's just one of those super wise people who sees trends coming really early on. Now, here's the excerpt from the pivot afterwards. So an afterward to the paperback edition is something that I wrote one year later After the hardcover came out of Pivot in September 2016, I had this post-launch pivot point and I went into super rest mode. I even did a podcast episode on post pivots and the furry rest monster or something along those lines. And so it was an interesting exercise to write the afterword, almost what didn't make it into the first edition of the book that I worked on from 2014 to 2016. What's missing? Here's the excerpt where I quote Mitch. My guiding principle now is faith in flow, a reminder that helps me trust the natural cycles of tension and release, hustle and flow, grit and grace. I listen for what's next, but try not to rush the answer. If the plant stage involves putting a pin in one's desired destination a year from now, entering my post-pivot rest mode was like hitting the current location button in a Maps app. It spun me back and helped me zoom in on where I was right now, not someplace off in the future where I should be. In the words of my friend and fellow author, Mitch Joel, instead of only focusing on what's next, we do well to reflect on the equally important question, what's now? And now, on to today's show. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. I am absolutely honored and overjoyed to have Mitch Joel here on the Pivot Podcast. This is long overdue and probably one of those things I never thought to ask Mitch because I just admire so much what he does and who he he is and how he shows up that it's almost like this unconscious shyness kicks in. Mitch, before I read your bio, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jenny. I'm happy to be here. You're uh, one of my most favorite people. So this is going to be fun. Right back at you. In fact, you were so generous to interview me on your podcast, Six Pixels of Separation, when Pivot 
came out. That was September 2016. Okay. And I got so much out of that interview, you interviewing me, that you know this already, but you made it into the pivot afterward, the special afterward for the paperback edition. It's fun to see you too. Like, that's probably the greatest. I love books so much that anytime I'm asked to blurb or I'm in the book or I'm in an index, to me, that's like my my sort of nerdgasm. Like I get super <laughs> excited when that happens, for sure. It's great. Nerdgasm. I think that might be the title of this episode. Go for it. That's a good one. Is that your, is that your neologism? No, I wish. I don't have any neologism. neologism. How do you say that yeah. word? I don't know. I don't know either. <laughs> but I, I think my forte with words is more like sort of playing with the play on words or coming up with like yeah. some interesting title. The other stuff I'm not that great at. So. See, my issue is I read so much and I even get my news media through the physical newspaper that I bungle pronunciation so often <laughs> because I'm never saying the words I'm reading, nor am I hearing it. I just, unless I hear it on a podcast, but I don't. So sometimes politicians' names or countries' names or a word like neologism. <laughs> Well, so the word that I I change, yeah. there's two words that I change or that I mix up and I don't know what's right. And the word is root or route. I, I don't, oh. I sometimes call it route. I sometimes say root. Um, and then the other one is data, which I will often call data. More oh, yeah. as a tip to Star Trek, but I feel like that's not how you say data. Like data is a character in Star Trek. Data is the right word, but I don't know. But the real question is, is it GIF or JIF? I think it's GIF. I do too. I do too. I think people who have been on the internet longer yes. will call it GIF. But you know what? That one I can figure out because I can speak to Gretchen McCullough, who's also a friend who wrote um, who wrote a really int- – she's an amazing linguist in, in particular about online culture. Like She's a linguist for Wired, and she wrote a book called – oh, my God – called i'll have to figure but she's great so she lives in montreal i will ask her about the gif or gif one okay. oh it's called because because internet is the name of her book because internet that's great yeah. you're great. you're an internet og let's let's be honest i mean you have over 700 episodes of your podcast seth godin was re- recently on to celebrate episode 700 in december yeah. and he said and i quote mitch joel you are in the pantheon you are one of the greats Yeah, it's crazy. So when you were saying, like, is that a word that you made up? I won't even say the word that describes the word you made up. I, my default is always, I think probably was Seth Godin. I just stole it. Like, I have been a a fanboy of Seth's. Before Permission Marketing came out, I was exposed to one of his books called Survival is Not Enough, which I think even to this day is one of the most underrated Seth Godin books and probably one of the most underrated business books in the world. And I met him in the early days at, I think, Internet World, just before he was launching Permission Marketing. And I just went like like ass over kettle into his world, like really immersed myself and became a a crazy follower of his to the point where when he started blogging, I was around. And I just remember I would tell everybody who was like blogging, like, what do you mean? I was like, this is the greatest gift in the world. When you have somebody who is as great of an author as Seth Godin is, and you're usually waiting, you know, two, three, four year cycles for books, because that's sort of the cycle of a book, to have him giving you free content every day, there is no greater treat and or gift in the world. And in this strange twist of fate that has happens to be my life, which is you know getting to be friends with people like you and other such moments of luck, I got to know him quite well, and we became friendly over the years. And he's just one of those people that I sort of know is a friend and know is always available, and yet I will never reach out or bother him. Um, and so whenever I, I'm interacting with him, I'm always kind of very sensitive to his time and, and who he is. And Even when I explain networking to other people, I talk about boxing in your weight class. Like, don't sort of, you know, don't don't try to outbox and ask for things you're not worthy of. And I feel with Seth, because of who he is, I'm always boxing out of my weight class for sure. But he's definitely one of the role models in my life. And when I say mentor, I mean like even if he weren't alive, he I think he would still be a very powerful mentor in my life. Absolutely. Just just from his work. Like, I don't need to physically interact with him to benefit from who he is. Completely 100%. And you and I are so similar because I would also consider Seth a friend. 
uh, he, he even I'm in his acknowledgments and this is marketing, which just about had me faint, like fall beside myself. I couldn't believe it. Like, what have I possibly brought this person who I yeah. admire so much? I still haven't asked him to be on the podcast. I get so shy. I will never, he did blur pivot, I will say, but I am the same way. And even in pivot, I talk about friend tours and the importance of networking among your peers because I don't really think it's appropriate to always be trying to reach up, up, up or, or pull those levers of the people you know, that have the most, the biggest platform. And so those are often the people that I reach out to the least. And not everyone would agree with that. They would say, you got to go for it. You just got to ask. And so many people will say yes, but I'm very protective about those relationships. Yeah, I'm the same way. So when we talk about that 700th episode, one is I don't like to celebrate those milestones. I've never been good with that, with birthdays, anniversaries. Like, I'm just not a person who's like, let's mark this one moment. It's probably a fault of mine. But I did think about it, and I was like, if I just sort of blow through it, I just don't know if I'm paying the actual show the respect it deserves. And then I really grappled with what did I want to do. And then I came up with that idea of let's talk about the state of podcasting. And I thought, who would be really interesting to talk to about this? And the reason I I chose Seth is because with his Akimbo podcast, and he does a podcasting workshop, and all the stuff he's doing with the Akimbo workshops, I felt like he was really moving in a different direction from one where he was like, it's all about my blog and writing words. And he's really embraced podcasting. In fact, he's like quoted in many articles talking about how podcasting is the new blogging type of thing. And so that became more of the catalyst. And I, you know, I, I always think that he's being gracious with me and, and, and very nice with his time. And I always feel like I don't deserve the time. But in this instance, I thought it was a topic he hadn't really talked about in detail. And I, for me, it was a great conversation. I think it just came out amazing. And I think Jay, yeah, Jay Akunzo actually had me on his show where he goes very meta and he talks about, he has a podcast about podcasting and talking about podcasts <laughs> and he sort of Those dissected. Yeah. And he really dissected that show with me on as a guest at the same time. And it was, it was fun to self reflect on how the questioning went and where we went in that show. It was I, fun. I loved that interview. I've now listened twice and I didn't let my podcast app indicate the episode was finished because I'm saving it to, to listen even a third time. I have a couple shows like that where I sort of yes. listen to them and I'm like, I don't I don't ever want this show to end and I want to be able to come back to it. And I would say actually in the past month or two, since we've been in this whole COVID-19 seclusion, I tend to go for longer walks. And there's been a, a real good handful of shows where I've been like, wow, that was just something I need to get back home, listen to, so I could take notes and focus more on some of the ideas. So yes. it's a treat when you come across a show like that. It's it, just it, the greatest thing. It really is. And especially when some of the the conversation is like really a challenge I'm grappling with or something I want to wrap my head around. And that's what I heard you doing in that episode too, as well, which is, what are we doing here? And you, so I was trying to work backward, 700 plus episodes in, when did you start? 2006? I would have to look, but but probably, but the math is fairly easier. It comes out every Sunday morning. And since starting, I never missed a weekend. That's a week. incredible. So it's, you know, I don't, I'd have to look at where I'm at this week. I think I'm 722. Yeah. So you would divide that by 52 and you'd figure out exactly how, okay. how stupid I am. You know, no, no. you know what? Now I don't feel guilty. I was thinking, what a bad podcast interviewer. I couldn't even, I, I forgot to go look at the original date. But if you don't even know, then I'm going to give myself no. a pass. <laughs> but no, but, and you should give yourself a pass because you and I have spoken a lot offline about sort of how we create and again, milestones and, and how long and how many numbers and Right. Yeah, I do a radio. I do a radio hit every Monday where I sort of do like this digital media catch up that includes like an app of the week. And I, I said something on this Monday's episode, like you know we've been doing this for a couple of years, and I think I went back after and it's like seven or eight years that I've been like on radio. Um, and I don't. It, it's I always laugh when I say stuff like that because it's like how stupid can you be to not really know how much time and effort you put into things? But on the other side. I really fashion myself, especially as I've had more and more time to reflect during this sort of self-isolation business, 
that I'm really more of a creator than anything else. I'm I'm not the promoter. I am not even really the editor because I tend to just put my thoughts out there based on the mood I'm in. Um, and I think you're very similar that you're just really producing and thinking about what to produce next. And because you like, as I have multiple platforms, it's almost overwhelming when you when when anybody else looks at it. And when I think about it beyond just the creating, it is overwhelming. I mean, it's quite a bit. So, so that's where I, I kind of like that. It, it's, it has a certain innocence to it that I find quite charming. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. And it's funny because I, I have this big thing about integrity and never lying and not even white lies and to the annoyance of people in my real, you know, <laughs> who are surrounded by me. And sometimes I feel bad. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, my listeners are going to think I'm lying because I'm overestimating, underestimating how much time I've spent on certain things because it does all start to blur together. And yeah, and you want to you want to give yourself more time to to like I do yeah. that too. Like I think I, I I don't lie. I just embellish because I don't know. Right, and it just it's, it but, is a blur. And and it, I think you and I are similar too in that we get to things early, and therefore it just evolves over time. It's not this and and I'm not really paying attention to the metrics very much either, if at all. And so similar to you, I, I just hit episode 200. So I bow to 700. But I thought to myself, all I'm going to do, I'm not even going to say in the episode, congrats to me, it's episode 200. I recorded a special, almost like your business poetry, it's called flow. And it was just a such a different type of episode. I set it to music. It's shorter. It's meant to put people in a different state of thinking and being. And that's it. I just, so it was 200, did something special and keep moving. But I yeah, I mean, I'm the type, I would, I would never even organize a party for my birthday. Like that alone is just, hey, everybody look at me. It's my birthday. I don't know. I have friends who have organized weekend trips for their birthday. And I think to myself, wow, I admire the the skills around that and yet i would never ask people to like get on a plane for my birthday although well that's the, they that's might the think that it's fun it, yeah. they might think that's that it's horror, fun yeah no i'm with you that's the horror of it like i <laughs> I, I i i like would feel guilty inviting people to like uh, weddings and stuff like my wedding because i was like i don't want them to feel like they have to give a gift like that's the level of which i have that same sort of there's probably something really deep in there in terms know. of you know, parenting and, and how we our, – our self-evaluations and things like that. But it is true that like this is like you know one of the, the truest things, which is lately because we've been in lockdown, I've been asking people who've said no to my show as a guest. Uh, you know, They had books that were really big or coming out that were just sort of – might have become big. And I thought, well, now I can reach out. It's a couple months later and sort of re – initiate maybe they would say yes and i've been having a lot of success in getting some really great names on the show that that you know been published and that are still coming out and whenever they pass me to a promotional person or an admin and the person says like how many people listen to your show i'm always like i don't know how to answer that because i don't know any of my analytics i've never logged into the google analytics for my blog i have never looked at the analytics thing on the Lipson tab in, in, the, in the dashboard. I just use that to upload the show, uh, which is the podcasting hosting platform for those who don't know. Um, and I kind of let them know that. I go, look, you, I, I don't know and I don't want to look and I don't, I understand why you might be asking because you maybe never heard of me and who is this person, but just take a look at the show and get a vibe for if that's something this person wants to do or not. I don't, and I don't, like I just refuse to answer that. Uh, and I, or, or I'll jokingly tell them, look, I will look, but I will triple it and you have, will have no idea whether I'm lying or not. You know, <laughs> just as a way to sort of be like, who cares? It doesn't really matter. I can't say that I've encountered it yet where a, a guest, a potential guest assistant has asked me, but on principle, I would not want to tell them my numbers. And therefore I would probably be stubborn about, like, if you're going to ask me that, then you're not, you don't deserve to be on my show. Um I I don't have – see, you have better <laughs> self-esteem than I have. I'm more like, yeah, that's a good question, and it's probably really bad, and I'm not going to even look because that will probably depress me and make me want to stop recording well, the show. So that's where thing. I go. Same <laughs> thing. That's why I hardly ever check my metrics. And even now – but the, but I can't say that I never have, but it's very rare. I remember when Pivot launched, I would check Amazon once every couple months to see the rank or to see the sales, and I had some authors that were refreshing every hour. But, oh, that's different. But yeah, I want to ask you – I want to ask you, okay, 
So I'm so impressed that you've never checked your Libsyn podcast listener stats. What then gives you a sense of traction and momentum versus, oh, you know, how do you know when you need to do something differently? And or how do you know when things are really working and you have that sense of traction? Well, in this sense, it's going to sound sort of altruistic, but I don't know and I don't care. It's not why I do it. I don't know. I don't know if it's got traction. I don't know if people like it. That's not why I do the show. So why do you do do the show? Well, I do the show because I have questions or I'm passionate about a book that I read or I like the person and individual and what I've seen in terms of their content. And I feel like we would have an interesting conversation. And selfishly, I feel like they will help me with the problems I'm having (laughs) and answering my questions because I'm not really asked. You know, my background was in journalism. And a lot of the things you do in journalism are to inform the audience. So it's sort of this weird dance of like, I know a lot about this topic and I'm going to interview this artist. And they're going to say the things that I know that they're going to say because I'm already a fan and I know. But now I'm going to inform you who may not know as much as I know. And that's kind of the way journalism works on one level. On the other level, it works from I have no idea who this person is. I was assigned this story. And what I uncover is going to be what you'll learn about in the process. I never liked that form of journalism because I really want to learn and I don't want to learn as the person is learning. It's a weird thing for me. I just don't like that. What What I like is ways in which I can get smarter and The only gauge I have is when I stop recording and I go, that was a really fun or interesting conversation. I learned a lot. I think it was engaging for that person too. It was challenging for both of us. And I hope people like that. But like we said earlier, I'm already thinking about the other 10 guests that I got to record and and move on to. And it's been, I would say, if anything, from a broadcasting perspective, a form of social proofing. It became this thing that I was doing back when I had an agency. It was part of the agency, my you know, Six Pixels of Separation, which is the name of the blog and the podcast. And it was a way to social proof to show people that were looking to hire us that, look, we don't just build platforms and digital stuff for people, but we actually do them and we've done them successfully and it worked. When it transferred over to me, when I sold the business about six years ago and I left about two, um, I I sort of just saw it as part of my continuation of my journey, which was I was freer to interview less about marketing, less about digital, and more about business thinking uh, strategy. So it's opened up a lot in, in the past couple of years, and I gauge the success by how interested I am in having these conversations, which is fun because I can also just say, no, like I don't need that or I don't need to speak to that person. Or that book didn't really inspire me that much. And I don't, I don't necessarily want to just promote it to promote it. 100%. I have when people suggest themselves for my podcast, I almost my head turns askew because I do the interview so much on intuition, just the timing, and I have to get this intuitive hit that this is the next person. And they're welcome to send me their book. That's not a problem. But there's no way I can answer in the moment unless it's just this instant, yes, 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 you, c- come on the show. I've uh, never responded well to a pitch to be yeah. from someone who wants to be on the show. And I have, uh, as you know, we can probably talk about text expander, but I have my own sort of <laughs> form reply back that's very kind and personal, but it's basically like not that interested, which is a tough thing to say because I don't want to really make anybody feel rejected. But I would even push it further and say that I, I carry a backlog. So I, 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 on any moment, could have between five and 15 episodes sort of in the can. And when you do weekly, that's your months out at that point. And I think that it's not even that intuitive in the moment of who inspires me and who do I want to speak to. But I actually look at it almost like being a DJ. Like when it's time for me to prep the show for Sunday, which is usually on a Friday I do it, I actually look at all the conversations and look at the week before and the week before that and – what kind of diversity can I add? What type of like, how would the flow of it feel? Like you don't want to, I, I want to make it feel like it's really a good flow, not to keep people from episode to episode, but just because I feel like that's a sort of subtle art of, yes. of, of creating a great show. It's like what, and I don't know, like, you know, I could probably pick someone who I want for next Sunday right now on a Tuesday that we're recording, but come Friday, it might be a completely different vibe. So that's where I become even like hyperintuitive. So it's not just who the guests are, but in what order they go. I've never heard anybody describe it like DJing. 
but that's so true. I used to make mixtapes and I do play, I, I do playlists now. And I think it really does. I mean, yes, there is a certain skill in just accumulating hours and hours of great music and just hitting shuffle. I love that vibe too, but I also really still enjoy a good playlist and I, that's my music background. And I think that it matters which songs go where on the album and how the album flows for an artist and, all of those things to me matter. It's like writing a book, right? Which order do the chapters go? And you're playing a DJ, right? The, the content was written. It doesn't take much to sort of shift stuff around if you're using Scrivener or however you write, but it is an art to DJ it properly. And I, I like that art. Like it's part of the skills that I like. I also find that there are times where I've gotten three months in the can of the podcast and it doesn't really work. So I, I then realize all these episodes in the can and my life changes, I change, or just the anecdotes I would share might be different. And so there is a point of diminishing returns on systems and planning ahead. Yeah, I mean, I'll take your advice on that because I, I typically deferred that when I was in organizations to people who have a better taste for that. My forte was more about uh, you know, sort of visioning paths and products and services and making sure the right mix of clients were there. And I don't, it's one of the things I respect most about our relationship is that you're so good with systems. It's, it's almost like I'm almost envious of that because I, I look around at my office and I'm like, I have like an eight and a half by 11 notepad. I've got a small Moleskine. I've gotten a smaller field notes. I use index cards. I have Evernote. I'll t- type notes in IA Writer. And I'm like, oh my God, if somebody could just, and as much as I try to create a quote unquote system, I feel like the chaos is the system for me. And that's not going to work if, if you work with me or for me. The chaos is the system. That's a good quotable. Oh, I just made it up. So it's all (laughs) yours. I know. See, I get very, very flattered and honored. It's really a joy if someone like you can say, oh, I appreciate your systems or I've learned something from you about systems or software or something. I'm, I'm so just joy in my heart. And yet when I think about, oh, maybe I should create more along those lines, I think to myself, systems are so boring to other people, you know, like I just always hesitate to go that route. Well, the, the, so your system might be boring to somebody. That that could be true. Like I don't I don't know, but a lot of times when we look at other people's systems, we improve our own or we tweak our own. We may not adopt it fully, one, two, three, but we may take point three and be, oh, I do that this way. It's one of the reasons why I love. Um, to talk about being anti-Seth Godin, because it's something Seth hates, but like, you know, what type of pencil do you use or what notebook do you use or when do you type or do you like coffee or tea or what music do you like? Like, I love those sort of how people write type of of articles and, and even books, like I've read books on that topic. And it's not because I need to use their system to do my thing or to copy them. I just think that there is art. It's almost like I, I love looking at paintings, but I really like looking at people's studios more. There's something about that That's that I awesome. find very romantic, you know? So, yeah. Well, the next time you're in New York, you can see the difference between my office and Michael's art studio next door. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. Yeah. Well, there is a big difference. In, but but now that all being said, you know, Seth Godin talks about being an artist and I, I really do prescribe to that. And I do. I think the environment that we choose to work in, you want to be like, I'm certainly mobile. I, I, I've been known to sit in an airport terminal when those were things we did and just be on the floor sort of trying to finish something out. And I can. I can write anywhere. But I do like having certain places. Like I have a separate office from my home. That's about a seven minute walk from where I am now. It's, it's more of a studio. It's myself and my business partner. At home, I definitely like having. Yes my specific cup with my morning coffee with the music on in a certain way. Uh, so I, you know, you sort of realize when you're, when you're ready for your best or when you're at your best versus when you have to. But I, I, I would argue that some people's work environments are, are, are pretty cool and, and better and more interesting than artists in environments, but that's just me. Well, going back to systems for a minute, I would love to know, after 720 plus episodes, 
both how you prepare for a guest who's about to come on your show. And I know you interview a lot of friends and people you know. So I wonder if the prep is different if you're starting fresh with somebody. So both how you prepare and what do you think makes a great interview? Yeah, great question. So there's a huge difference between someone you know and someone you don't know. Because for my taste, shows that are usually better are those where the guest and the host have a certain level of familiarity. I just think it's more interesting because there's an energy and it's almost like you want to understand the the inside sort of story a little bit. So I do think there's a difference between the two. In terms of how I prep, it is, you know, this is one of those do as I say, not as I do, because the way I do it is not the way I would recommend other people do it. But people who don't know beyond the 700 episodes I spent close to 10 years interviewing lots of musicians, rock stars, and entertainers for a whole bunch of magazines, some that I published, others that I wrote for, others that were for record companies and biographies. And I sort of built a system because of the frenetic pace at which we were both publishing back then and just the nature of how that business was rolling in the late 80s and 90s into the 2000s. So what I do now is... I basically consume as much as I am interested in about the person. Sometimes it's reading the whole book. Sometimes it's skimming it. It's Googling. It's YouTubing. It's Instagramming. It's Twitter. It's Wikipedia. It's sort of just like, uh, what are they up to? What are they about? If there's something that I'm nervous I won't remember to talk about, I might take a note. But in general, when I have somebody on my show, I have a blank sheet of paper, eight and a half by 11, with their name at the top, the date that we're recording. And I will have usually written underneath it the names of their books or if there's any sort of pertinent like stuff like that that I just don't want to say wrong by accident on the show. Maybe there's that one or two note that I want to make sure I don't forget. Otherwise, the page is blank. We have a conversation. As we're having the conversation, I'm actually taking notes and writing questions off of what they're saying. And what's weird is by the end, I have this sheet of paper that looks like questions that you would prep for an interview. (laughs) Like it's not, there's nothing really else to it. I don't really prep differently for friends or people I know versus people I don't know, but I'm very cognizant at the top of the show that I try to create a sense of familiarity or comfort for them much quicker. Because it's easy for me on my show to say, like Jenny, like how long have we been friends? And like even that will make it, will create a, a level of comfort for everybody. I think yourself, the listener, the guest, all that stuff. If it's somebody that I don't know, I might ask a more complex question that makes them realize this person really understands the work I'm doing, and this isn't just a one-on-one conversation. I'll also let them know usually in the pre in the run up to the show, like right before we record, that it's super conversational. It's not Q and A. We're going to go back and forth. That I know you don't know me, but I'm an experienced business person. I've been doing this a long time too, so it's not really an interview. It's a conversation about the work you do. Even in saying that, it, it sort of loosens the interviewer versus guest, which I always try to avoid. I want it to be. I really do want it to be a conversation. Did that answer your question? Oh, yeah. I love how you just put that. And I, in fact, because I was going to ask you, how do you qu- quickly create that rapport? And just hearing how you phrase that, because I usually say too, this can be very uh, conversational. But I love how you specifically say, I'm a business person. This is a conversation more than an interview. Or this is a conversation, not an interview. Just that distinction alone is so good. And and also letting them know it's not going to be 101, just tracing back through their book that's a fossilized form of their ideas from five years ago. Yeah, the, nothing made me crazier because I did so many interviews for both of my books, Six Pixels and Control-Alt-Delete. But Control-Alt-Delete was the harder one because I, I built it as, as this book that was cut in two. It was sort of like part one was uh, Control-Alt-Delete Your Work. Uh, control part two is control of delete your life right this idea like how do you reboot work and think about it more digitally how do you do the same for your life and i think in the first half of work i I don't even remember now but i think i had like my sort of five ways and you do these interviews with radio stations or whatever and 
nice enough people, but they would be like, what are the five steps? And I would just be like, uh, where are we doing this? Am I going to have to like, one, pull out the books? I don't even remember them. Or, or two, like, what's the point? Like there is the book that has all of them. And so can we just, can you just choose one that really inspired you? And I hate, I hate laziness. I hate lazy content. I hate lazy interviews. I hate lazy conversations. I hate laziness when it comes to, to this because I have a massive amount of respect for the publish button. And regardless of the fact that we can, you know, shoot out a tweet or an Instagram photo, I think part of my flaw in building a bigger audience is in the fact that I respect it too much. Like I won't do five ways to build a better brand. Like I could, and it'd probably be great. And people would probably love it. I just can't do that. It's just not. So and it's, it's, it's out of respect for the button. Like it's, it's out yes. of respect for publishing. And, and because the intention shifts subtly toward how do I get more clicks? And it's no longer about your intention for the idea itself. That's what drives me crazy about the clickbait lists, yeah. goals, headlines, et cetera. But they work. I, I think I'm more evil than that. Like, I, <laughs> What really bothers me is the fact that people get a lot of traction off of stuff like that. And I feel the content is very hollow. It, 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 there's not a lot of protein, carbs, and minerals in it. It's really unleavened. You know, There's just nothing really in it that's going to give you anything unless you really don't know anything. And that's in general the issue I have with a lot of content is that I recognize that there's the sort of dummy's guide to or, you know, the how to get started on. That's great. And there are times when I need that for sure. I mean, I hop on YouTube almost every day looking for one-on-one instructions on a myriad of subjects. But when it comes to business and content, I don't want to be that person. Like, you know, right now it's very common to see our peers giving webinars on you know, how to think about your employees and you know, how to really care for them in this time when they are working remotely and everyone's scared. And I kind of look at that content and go, if you're an executive and you don't already know that, I think your business is pretty doomed. Like, I'm always like, who is <laughs> that really content funny. for? Like, I, so a, a lot of it is that. And then, you know, I fully recognize that there's this massive market of people who are just switching jobs and maybe they're first time entrepreneurs and they don't know how to deal with this. And they're, and that's great, like produce for them. But I, when I look at that content as an executive, I don't get much value from it. So I'm always like, I need to create the content that, that I need to read, which is like, why, why write a book, right? Write the book that you haven't read yet. Like yes. That's the whole yes. sort of the thing there. And again, I can be very harsh on it because when I want somebody to talk to me about, let's say, that topic in particular, I want that person not to have an opinion. I want that person to have demonstrated in the marketplace that they've done this super successfully. And then to make matters even more complex, I want that person to be amazing at communicating it to me in an engaging and compelling way. I love now, that perspective. But it's a tall order. Like, I, I look, you and I speak for a living or used to speak for a living. Well, hopefully we'll be back to that. But I would get on stages with some amazing leaders from brands that you and I would be like, oh, my God, I can't believe we're going to see this person talk about that brand. And they're so bad at talking and presenting and communicating in that forum. Doesn't mean they're bad leader. Doesn't mean they're not successful. Doesn't mean they haven't built a world class brand. But it does mean that they haven't mastered that skill. And so it's almost like the triple threat, right? It's like that person who can sing, dance, and act. I kind of want that when it comes to content that I would consider to be a bit more 101-ish. So then I want to hear it from someone who's really done an amazing job at it. And that's just my own sort of selfish way. I love it, though. That's such a great way to phrase this triple threat of thought leadership, if you will. And uh, like even for me, it's ten years ago. I had this allergy to being a motivational speaker. That if all I did was speak about speaking or some kind of meta pyramid scheme of my own life, where I was not actually doing anything but just sort of like motivating people, that was going to drive me nuts. And and that's I think partly why I'm hypersensitive to it. But also what you said about business leaders being able to speak clearly and effectively. I've, I've done this thing where sometimes I try to bring people who are not published authors onto the podcast, of course, because I don't want to be an echo chamber. 
And yet I've noticed some of them do just fine. Some of them, I have to do such intense editing because they're not used to speaking in this format. (laughs) There's a lot of ums. They don't have clear ideas or or able to clearly communicate. So as, as talented as the person may be, IRL, it actually doesn't always translate right away. And it is a, a skill to be able to talk about what they know. It's it's the sort of most powerful skill, if you're going to ask me. And I've written about this and spoken about it, but that piece of content didn't resonate <laughs> enough to sort of make it to the top. But I think about this all the time. I have, I have young kids. I see people that I mentor out of university. I see startups. I don't expect everybody to have the same level of communication skills that I have after just even the 15 years of doing you know, a lot of public speeches. But I remember sitting in a boardroom and then saying, we're going to go around the room and introduce ourselves and maybe add in one thing that you found interesting. And, and I would watch it going around the room and I'd be sitting there as the lump in my throat got bigger and bigger. And my wife, my wife says that I get cotton balls. It's like my mouth is suddenly filled with cotton balls and everything's dry. And I'm sort of like, you know, lip, licking my lips and trying to find some, some sort of moisture to get the words out or the clearing of my throat and the nervousness and the anxiety in the stomach, that whole thing. And it took you know, me as a professional, I was probably in my late 20s or 30s before I started understanding that actually the people that I look to the most, it's not that they're the smartest. It's not that they have the best businesses. It's not that they built the most unique brands. It's been their, their, them being compelling in their communication. And that's when I realized that while I'm good at the written word and sometimes good at speaking because I'd done radio for a bit, that it would serve me well to get way more comfortable being able to stand up in front of a group, no matter what the size, and cogently explain something, like in a really compelling way, like really cogently. And that, I, I believe, is, is the skill to study, whether it's in elementary school, high school, or, or continually. I think that if I had more of those opportunities, like think about public speaking or how it was when we were younger. It was like you wrote this thing out, then you printed it out on cue cards, and yeah. then you stood and read from it. You looked down, you looked up. People were just staring at you. You had no idea what you were doing. We fell into the feedback loop that that is some form of normalcy when it's not. Like the hardest, you know what the hardest thing to do in the world is? The hardest thing in the world to actually do is to stand up in front of any size audience and read to them something you wrote aloud well. Because the way you write is not the way you speak. And doing it is very, very hard. And even when I watch authors of fiction do it well, an example would be Neil Gaiman, who does it really well. I'm like, that in and of itself is the art form. Not just the fact that he wrote those words, but it's the fact that he could read them. So, well, David Sedaris would be the black belt level of that type of, of, of ability. And if you if you watch David Sedaris in Masterclass, which I've done, and I think it's a fantastic series, he's really clear on how each night that he reads it, he'll go back to his room and print it out on paper and look at how one section goes. And he'll take notes while he's reading it when the somebody cough and like to him coughing is the death of an idea right it's like worse than nothing it's like people are and so you start seeing as he and he goes through iterations and iterations of it and you start realizing well maybe it got better over the 12 versions in 12 nights but it was pretty amazing at the beginning but it was less about how amazing it was to read and more interesting to see how the performance of it comes out and people i think executives often forget that they're performing every day when they walk in they're performing People have to feel like you've got this, and or if you don't have this, that that we're part of something together, but we understand the path, and I, it just always cycles back to the same thing. It's a long-winded way for me to say communication is very important. Yes, well, and I think it's helpful for people to hear because you are a very successful, both business person. I mean, everything. Very successful, everything man, <laughs> sure. um, business yeah, exactly. person, writer, podcaster, author, speaker, and to hear you used to get cotton mouth. Would, or nerves. Me too. When I was in college, my heart would pound out of my chest oh. just to introduce myself to our small group of the breakout of a big lecture room or something. And then I used to get hives. I turned bright red. That's why I took the training job at Google, because I knew that it would help if I want to be an author someday. So at Google, my first year there, I trained every day, day in, day out, talking about AdWords. <laughs> but it yeah. got me to be less panicked. In front of a room. So it's not, it doesn't come necessarily 
all the way naturally, though I'll say I did speak at my high school graduation as well. But I mean, nervous as hell. I just, I liked the writing and I have a journalism background too, but that's my own tangent. My my worst, the the one that really brought it to to the sort of, you know, to, to the surface for me was I was doing a lot of charity work. As, and I actually worked as a professional in a charitable organization. I was the editor of a magazine that featured young people. You know, where I live in Quebec, there's a big difference between the English population and the French population. We had a lot of these, the Anglophones moving away because French is the predominant language here and it's enforced by law. It's very different than even Paris and France. And um, we were trying not to have a, a brain drain. In the, in the province and in the city of Montreal. And so they, they were publishing this community organization was publishing this newspaper, basically, it was online too, that was highlighting young people and what they were doing professionally in the hope of inspiring others to stay. So it was a very cool initiative, but you would be involved in very interesting meetings within that organization because I was working on this out of the communications department. And again, you'd be going around the room to like a lay volunteer meeting. And these people were like all captains of industry. And I'd be like, oh, my, it's going to come to me. Like, what do you do? I write the newspaper here. Like, I, you know, it just felt like this is just not good. And I'm, I, I don't even deserve to be at the table. And that was a really good training ground for like, how do you build confidence and say what you do confidently when you really are back to where we were originally talking, sort of the boxing in your weight class. Like clearly I wasn't boxing my weight class in that room, but I needed to be there. And it it did, it really inspired me. And it also made me strive. It it, it made me strive to want to be like them. Be mm-hmm. have that level of success, have that level of respect, have that level where the community is calling you in for your opinion versus like you're here and being paid. So there's a lot of stuff that comes from our ability to look at moments where we don't feel good or we feel quite inferior in an environment. To it's like it is. It's a our, we have, we have a mutual friend in in Alyssa Cohn, and she talks about the struggle being more of a puzzle. And I found that yes. I find that very illuminating. That idea of like this problem, and it's my problem, and it's my business again, or my idea against this, to suddenly become a puzzle that I have to solve. I really like that analogy, and I I reflect, even though it's a new concept from her to me, I've been reflecting on it a lot and seeing like actually when I've been most successful, it's when I put all my emotions and energy aside and just focused on it being a puzzle. I love that perspective too. And this takes us full circle to connecting with friend tours or people we admire. And this might be my stubbornness and it may be a flaw or a blind spot, but I would rather, instead of me reaching out to someone five leaps ahead, like Tim Ferriss, okay, I am not going to reach out to him. It just motivates me to be great, so great that he is inviting me on his podcast. You know what I'm saying? Or he, he is excited to say yes to coffee or not. You know what I mean? So I, I just like somehow it's, it's not compare and despair, but there's a level of, I just get motivated to be so helpful or interesting or innovative that the people I admire are just as excited to connect with me as the other way around. Did that make sense? It does. It it does. But I do think sometimes you have to game the system a, a little bit. You know, I really do believe that you have to game the system a little bit. So the example that I'll use, we can use Tim, Tim Ferriss, which is a good one. Yeah, tell uh, us in what I, way. So uh, I, I've i met him and heard about him many times. In fact, I was in that earlier circle when he was really trying to get the four-hour work week out. He was speaking to a lot of bloggers and in that sort of, I'll call it, I, I use the word all the time, and I know it's a bad word that I use, but I call it the zeitgeist. I use the word zeitgeist all the time. It's, My it's dad bad. shortens it to zeit, the zeit. Yes, the zeit. <laughs> um, and I wasn't, I didn't sort of like really burrow into the relationship like others did, but we, there was a moment where there was this um, mastermind event Jason Gaynor puts on early days and I was able to interview Tim live on stage and he didn't know me, but I'd known him and I don't know if he knew who I was or anything like that. But that gave me just an inch that when, a, you know, when his book was coming out, the other book, I forget which one it was, that I felt okay to reach out and say, hey, can you be on my podcast? And again, this was – he was famous, you know, sort of moving towards where he, now I would say he's super famous. But it gave me a bit of – like I love grabbing inches where I can. And I think that's th- – those are good examples of, 
you could wait and you could say, I want my stuff to be so great that they call me. But I also do think that if there are ways for you to get inches a bit ahead, it's almost like those fast forwards in, in The Amazing Race, uh, that they're helpful. You want to try and grab them when you can. So there are instances when they need. And if you can identify those instances where you are being quite benevolent and, and helping, it's powerful. It's powerful. So I, I tend to I tend to jump on those moments where I see a bit of a fast forward. Well, definitely aligning with when it's helpful to them. But let me just rewind for a minute and unpack this a little more. You were already at a place and a status in the industry that Jason asked you to be the interviewer in that case, invited you to the mastermind forum. I forget what it's exactly called. Mastermind, mastermind Talks. talks. Mastermind okay, talks, Mastermind yeah. Talks. But, and but again, but so but, you already had in a way you had already demonstrated expertise to the point where you conducted the interview and then to me it makes sense. Like I wouldn't hesitate necessarily to circle back after that either. No, there's I think there's a lot of luck and timing there. Like I you know, I don't know how many podcasts were out and how many people were in Canada and But Jason that's foresight in- because you were podcasting. <laughs> Right, but I, I don't want to discount the valor, the value and power of of really being lucky. And I do think that you know it, people go, oh, you know, you know, when you put in a lot of effort, you know, luck, all that. Stuff. I, I I think that's true, but I also do think that I've just been really, really privileged beyond my obvious, you know, white male privilege of having a lot of really good luck and timing, like a lot of it. And so again, if we were fat to fast forward to, let's say that same situation a year later, I don't know if that would have been the case. Gay Hendricks has a new book. He, he wrote The Big Leap, which I loved. And he has a new book out about luck. I feel like you should have him on your show. I want to hear you interview him about luck. I would this, love that. This so, topic so make that happen. Okay, great. I'm on it. No, this topic, I think luck is its own entire conversation, because you're so right. And it it, isn't a kind of a paradox that so much of what happens in our life, including our birth and our family of origin is pure luck. And yeah, a lot of the little steps you take along the way are helpful too to position you for that luck. So so yeah, I, I I don't know how many types of luck there are, but I think there are there's sort of what I would just call the genetic lottery for sure, right? Because the only real difference between you and I is space and time. That's the only difference between us and a homeless person, somebody who's born in a third world country, someone who's currently living in war torn. Uh, you know, if you have a child, it's like what are the odds of that child being your child and not being you know in some refugee camp somewhere else? It's space and time. It's just there's that there's that luck. There's also just sort of on top of that then luck of of geography i think there's luck of education which all of this is aligned to privilege for sure but then i also think there's like this weirder luck of just like you can't trace it type of thing when i think back to that job we talked about where i was working within this community that's where i met um, i mean almost all my current connections from my existing my previous business partners, but I still call them my existing business partners, to my wife, to you know certain people who introduced me to other people that I could directly correlate back to that one job and institution. But what got me there? And then I think about you know having success in the publishing and magazine business, but then being burned out by it and wanting to just sort of lay low, take that job and spend time working on it. Like there's all these things that are just so strange in terms of timing and opportunity. You have to capitalize on it for sure. You have to be able to convert it for sure. But I just really think that luck plays a much bigger part. And again, it's it's tough to say because we want to take credit for being smart and good and all this. And true, true, true. But I think it's way more luck than we want to ever admit to because it would be hard to admit it. Was it you? Is it you in your conversation with Seth? I'm like, a wise person recently said, um, I think it might have come from your podcast, but that the, your favorite people that you enjoy listening to are so much more humble than the opposite. Like they're actually talking about the challenges, the, and it's, it's not glorifying failure, but I, I'm pretty sure it was on your show. One, one it way could or another. Be, you know, one of the things uh, I tell sort of this, this two, this two tone story. One is one of the proudest moments uh, of my professional life was when I sold my business uh, six years ago with my three other business partners. And we were sitting in our boardroom in our office, in one of our offices. And we were going through this. I mean, I actually have a picture of the pile. You know, when you sign legal documents, there's the please sign here, that little post-it thing. The pile of those was like, it was a mountain. 
And I remember just sort of looking to the side of where I was sitting. I, I, I saw my jeans and my, my sneakers, and I had this immense amount of pride that I was able to do this and sell my business to the number one player in the industry, and I was still wearing jeans and sneakers because ultimately I'm just a heavy metal punk rock kid. That's who I am. And I was so proud that I was able to do it without – not being fake and wearing a suit, but because some people do it really well. It would just be inauthentic for me. And it went back to a lot of – my sort of life, which has been very lucky too, which is I've been going to the TED conference for over a decade. And in the early days of TED, you would see like Larry and Sergey and Mark Zuckerberg and all these people who were at the time still Google and Facebook, not at the level now, but still, I can't believe they're right there. And I would, I would always sort of, it's interesting that they're just wearing jeans or like a Patagonia sweater or like a Lululemon thing. It, the people that I really respected from success, and part of success for me is definitely money, they don't really flaunt it or show it. It's not the, the the sort of luxury brand flashy things. They might very well get into a private limo and hop on a you know a private plane and go somewhere, and they they do. But but optically, when you're with them, they sort of just feel like you, which I think makes me feel like anybody can then do that. And that's a longer definition of maybe humble. Like I don't know if it's the word humble so much as really really cool and not putting it in people's faces i like that about i like that about people to me nowadays it's the difference between influencer culture and thought leadership or just original i don't innovation so overhyped as well but influencer is look at me look what i'm doing in my life look what i'm wearing look what i'm buying look what i'm selling for the most part and then, and then for me, that just doesn't resonate. I don't want to know what you're wearing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, yeah, I just don't. I, I look at, uh, yeah, yeah. I I see it a bit differently. Where, uh, like, like let's take the speaking business because you and I know it really intimately well. I I never liked speakers whose social platforms are just promotions for the fact that they're speaking. Here I am on stage here. Here I am on stage here. I'm getting on a plane because I got a gig there, prepping for my gig. Here are my slides. I always look at speakers like that and I go, I have, I know this person. I've done events with them. I have no idea what work they do. Like I, And again, it's a personal choice. I would look at my content and be like, everything that I'm producing is about the content that I speak about on stage. Yes, I'll put the odd picture of self-promotion. We all do that. But I often find that in the speaking business, all of the content is about the fact that they're speakers, but not about what they speak about, not about creating more content for that, not about creating more value for that. And it's this very interesting new thing. Like even speaking as a profession seems very bizarre to me, even though it's primarily what, you know, what I do. But I see it more like I have done something to a level of excellence. I have a skill set in being able to present it. And I say that with a lot of humility because it's not easy for myself to self-compliment. And I know that I do it well based off of the feedback and the work that I've done and how my career has evolved. But I would never say that like I'm a professional speaker. Like it's a weird thing that like that's like my job. Like shouldn't your job be building an excellent business and being able to communicate about it well and then having people want you to speak about it? Right. And the answer is, of course, that that's true. But again, that's the difference of – and it's my own personal struggle, which I've talked about before. I like people who speak from experience versus people who speak from opinion. Yes. It's just my own little Totally tweak. fair. Yeah. So we probably have time for one more question. You, I'm going to give you a choose-your-own-adventure or bonus points if you somehow address both. <laughs> okay. Wow. Okay. One question is how on earth you produce so much content each week, speaking of ideas and original thinking. And the other question is about Groove, No Trouble, your electric based podcast. Uh, I love that you do that. It, it, it must be so fun to just geek out with fellow musicians. And I wonder, because that one is so specific and so niche, not that you even look for traction, but I just wonder what it's been like having that show and what it's opened up for you in your life or your career, given that it is kind of a side path from the main road of business that you're so known in. Oh, Jenny Blake, I'm going to wrap this one in such a good bow. You're not going to Yay! Believe. I'm hearing that smile over there. <laughs> yeah. It's awesome. I was, I was in New York City at the tail end of, of me basically selling the business, not leaving the business, but selling it. And I was feeling quite creatively unsure. 
you know, if I'm still, if I sold the business and I'm still in the business for many years, what will six pixels look like the podcast and my articles and my writing and what sort of flow as I know that I was going to take content and segue it. I didn't know if I would be able to leave with six pixels of separation, but I was feeling quite creatively unsure. It's no longer my business. My job is to just grow it, which we were doing. And it was all sort of in this machine to a certain degree. And I'd never done this, but I was going to New York City and I emailed Seth Godin <laughs> and I said, hey, would you meet me for anything, knowing full well that he does not take meetings and he does not like meeting people. It's not his thing. Um, but he was like, I would love to because I don't think I've ever asked in all the years. And I think he sort of was like, I have to be in this. City. I don't know what it was. I'm tr- I'm probably that making it. That you're Mitch and he loves it. what you do. <laughs> Anyways, so he was, <laughs> he, he, was, okay. he was kind enough to meet with me and uh, we sat down and he said, so what's going on? I said, you know, I'm sort of like having this creative existential crisis. Uh, and he knew about my music thing. And I was like, one of the things I was thinking about was actually traveling with my electric bass, which I hadn't played in forever. And taking lessons in every city that I'm speaking in just to sort of kill the day, but also to maybe open open up new pathways like i'm not sure and like is that a ridiculous and i was sort of just saying that off the cuff in, in the spirit of many things and seth kept saying uh electric bass cory cory electric bass cory and i was just like you know maybe i'll do this and then at one point i realized we were having like two very different conversations and i couldn't figure out why and i was like seth slow down so the cory what are you talking about cory he's like cory brown i'm like who he's like cory brown um is the guy that i worked with at squidoo Corey also runs notreble.com, which happens to be the largest website for bass players. I had known notreble.com because it is that, and I'd been following it, but I had no idea who Corey was, nor that he was the guy who had worked on Squidoo with Seth. And so I was like, oh, no, I didn't even make that connection. And as we were talking, I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to take the content, uh, like the sort of framework of, of six pixels and apply it to bass players because what I discovered in my sort of reattachment to the bass and the and bass players is there's not a lot of, their stories don't get told. Like whenever there's an interview with somebody famous on the bass, let's talk about Tony Levin, who's the bass player with uh, Peter Gabriel. It would be like what gear he uses, what riffs he, how he does stuff and how, or how he plays Sledgehammer or whatever. But I always wanted to know like about him. This is a guy who played in King Crimson, and he does this amazing thing called Stickman with his brothers, where he plays these really interesting stick instruments. And I just thought there was so much more that I, I wasn't getting when I Googled it or, or looked for it. And uh, he made the introduction to Corey. Corey, turns out, was a fan of Six Pixels of Separation. And so when I brought this idea of that sort of long form, deep conversation, no gear talk, no riffs, no sponsorships, but just about the artist, he was like, let's do this. And so that led, you know, I'm going back now five or six years, I think, to um, the first episode of Groove, the No Treble podcast, which we managed to get Robert Trujillo for our first episode, who is the bass player for Metallica, which is unbelievable, because Robert was doing talk about timing and luck. Robert was uh, producing a documentary on a very famous bass player who died very young, whose name is Jacko Pastorius, who very much revolutionized the instrument. And that just led to this amazing journey where I do that show monthly. And I, I claim that we're going to try and build the largest oral history of electric bass players. I don't know how far we'll get, but but it's been very successful. And I think it ties into the the how do you produce so much content? Because the, the same question is, how do you make time to work out? How do you make time to read? How do you make time to cook for your family? How do you make time to do yoga? And the answer is always the same. You make time for the things that are important to you. And my content was never an engine of it's part of the business and it's part of success and you have to do this. My content was always a function of, oh my God, I have all these messy disparate notes everywhere and I need a place to put them out. I like writing, I like speaking, I like doing it in long form. So blogging, article writing, podcasting, having conversations like this, it doesn't feel like it takes any time for me. And then as you do it more and more, you sort of have that system, whatever that system is, but I have more of an editorial calendar. I know how things are going to flow each week. And it doesn't feel like a lot of pressure or work. It feels like that's really where I'm supposed to be spending my time. So when you're producing a lot of content, it shouldn't be because you have to produce a lot of content. It should be because it's just the thing you're doing. And I think I nailed both questions and wrapped them in a bow for you. You most certainly (laughs) did. And what a beautiful bow. 
Wow, I'm very impressed. Nice work, Mitch Joel. I'm going to give you these forks in the road well, more again, often. <laughs> I, think, I think we need to give praise once again to Seth, who just became a connector and, a, yeah. and, and somebody who, again, like, there's no better word when you have a mentor or somebody, but when they do something friendly. And, you know, you and I have known each other for many years, but very recently, we've been doing a lot of friendly things for one another. Yes. And I know you'll say to me, let me know if there's something I can do for you. And I always feel like whispering back, you already did. You know, you oh. made me feel like, I, like you know, but it's true. Like, I think cool. friends don't think of like what the check mark is. Friends mm -hmm. feel very satiated when they help the friend. Yes. And so even even though, you know, it's more friendly maybe than friends, I, I think that that feeling is is very empowering. And it's a great lesson for mentors and people who really have those physical relationships with, with certain people because it's always it feels uneven. But if there's some way to make it friendly where you feel like giving was way better than receiving, it's it's magical. So he does that magically and you do that magically. So I'm appreciative for that for both of you. Well, thank you. That really means a lot. And and likewise, right back at you. I love how you just described that. And that to me is the magic and magnetism of authentic connections or even authentic content, like you just talked about. With podcasting as the one output method that I actually feel like I'm playing hooky on the rest of my business because it's so yeah, fun, yeah, you know. And yeah. and on the subject of Seth, I think this edit this episode will be dedicated to Seth and our appreciation for him. Talk about friendliness. I have to share this anecdote because you you brought him back so full circle and it, it occurred to me at the beginning and I thought, no, I'll just leave it out. This is how, this is who Seth is, I think, to me in an anecdote that I'll never forget. I was co-working at his office because every now and then um, I, I'm friends with some people who work in there and it's just a quick train ride. And he was going to give us a ride to the train station and it started dumping rain, just absolutely buckets, buckets. I had left my umbrella in his office and Seth took off his raincoat, this yellow raincoat, handed it to me and said, here, take this home with you. I'll, I'll, I'll get it back when I see you next. His jacket, like his jacket off his own back. You know what I mean? On a day where it's dumping rain. I just couldn't. It's like, I don't think people can grasp if you only know him from his ideas and what he puts out. He's already so original and unique, but it's like those tiny moments that so show character in such an incredible way and, and show like this giving nature. It's just really something. total magic. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's magic. And and the thing is when I hear these stories, I'm always like, you're not surprised. Oh, like, well, I'm not surprised, but I, I also don't want to create false hope for people who think, I know. you know, cause it's it, these, these people are, are very hard to reach. They're very, very busy. And they choose the people they want inside the tent, uh, I think, really cautiously and carefully, especially as they ascend in the world of fame or success or whatever it is. And I do try to remember what it was like when I needed access inside that tent. I try. I'm not always great at it. But so when I hear those stories, I also don't want people to be super disappointed. But uh, sometimes it's great. And sometimes you just have to find someone else. <laughs> Well, I, I agree. I wouldn't say when you're done listening, go email. I wouldn't even really say <laughs> go for an umbrella. Yeah. No, and I, nor would I say go email Mitch. I would actually say, great. I'm so happy that I, I was going to say to your no note about podcasting. I think it's actually perfect for people like you and me because we get to reach out to people and add value through a conversation that's recorded for everybody. The host, the interviewee, hopefully the listeners. I just feel like it's such a giving medium in that way. And when people write to me on LinkedIn, and they say, Hey, can you help me figure out how to get a job? I'm like, you have 200 plus podcast episodes to catch up on in a book, two books, <laughs> you know, yeah. like, no, so I would never even say after this, unless the guest specifically offers themselves, which some people do. And even that confounds me, uh, perplexes me, I would just say, be grateful for the learning that you can get from somebody even from afar. And that's already so much like you said mitch about reading and books yeah a lot of power in in, uh, in finding mentors that that have long been dead or have published or have put things out there you don't have to be in everyone's face sometimes it's better to just have those people be in your brain oh what a beautiful another beautiful bow 
Thank you so, so much, Mitch Joel. This had, was so fun. I didn't even get to read your bio. We didn't talk about Decode the Future. We didn't even talk about the sickness, as my four-year-old niece calls it. Uh, wow, we'll have to do a follow-up. Mitch, I cannot thank you enough. What a joy to have you here. Thanks, Jenny. My pleasure. Thanks for, for initiating this. I appreciate you. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Pivot Podcast. Make sure you don't miss an episode or my insider tips and templates by signing up for Pivot List, a curated twice monthly newsletter where I share the inside scoop on what I'm reading, watching, listening to, and the latest tools I'm geeking out on. Sign up at pivotmethod.com slash pivotlist. Get show notes from this episode at pivotmethod.com slash podcast and connect with me on Twitter at Jenny underscore Blake. Remember, build first, then your courage will follow. Hasn't it always 